I have a message that I'm going to try to deliver, but I don't know what the Holy Spirit wants to do. So I'm just going to do my best to be obedient. If that's okay with you guys, you okay with me being obedient to Jesus this morning? And then whatever God wants to do, we'll let God have his way. Um, in prepping for this message and just spending time, um, spending time with Jesus. Uh, and even before prepping for this message, you just live, you, you get to a point where you live life. And it's funny, I'm laughing at myself even now saying that because usually you get to a, per, uh, you have to be at a certain age <laughs> to qualify to say, man, you've just lived some life. <laughs> But sometimes it's not age, um, not necessarily age that gives you that qualifying mark, but sometimes it's just the things that you've gone through in life yeah. to be able to say yeah. you've lived some life yeah. because there's people that are younger than me that have gone through some things and they can stand here and say, yeah, I've lived some life because they have life experiences. But as I was reflecting in time of prayer, um, I went before Jesus in I was just, I was a little, I was frustrated and I was frustrated at myself because I know that Jesus has called me to different things in my life, um, to be a husband, to be a father, um, to areas in ministry. And um, there's things that I've, I've learned about myself. Uh, CJ does, does a, a deal called Strength Finders and it kind of helps you understand how you operate and what your strengths are. It's like a personality evaluation. I've done some personality evaluations and just to find out a little bit more about myself and um, a little bit about my personality is I, I lean towards a perfectionist and I, I, have, I, I operate high in responsibility and strength finders. So when something's given to me, when a task is given to me, um, I take mental responsibility very heavily that I'm going to complete that task and not only complete that task, but I'm going to do everything I can to, perf to uh, complete it to the best of my ability. And, and so some of those things cause frustration in my own life. Um, when, I'm, when, I don't, when I don't lead exactly the way I know God wants me to in my house, um, when I don't necessarily move in ministry, uh, maybe sometimes as fast as I think I should, but maybe that's not God's plan, but still it can be frustrating to me. Um, just simply feeling like I'm not living up to the measure that God had for me. Um, and it's, it's just frustrating because in my personality, I want to please God. Whatever God's given me, whatever responsibility I have, I want to do my due diligence to please God and to walk worthy of the callings that he's put on for my life. And so I, you know, went to God in prayer and I just begin to tell him, God, I'm frustrated. Like even sometimes I feel like my devotion, my time in prayer, my worship, I feel like it's lackluster. I, I don't feel like I'm meeting you the way I normally do. God, this is frustrating because I don't feel like I'm being everything that you have for me to be. Even in this moment, I know that you're growing me. I know that you're stretching me and who I'm going to be in a year. It's nowhere close to who I am right now. But God, even in this moment, I'm frustrated because I feel like I'm not who you're calling me to be. And in that moment, as I paused, probably because I ran out of words to complain with, <laughs> I heard the Holy Spirit say, stay close. I heard the Holy Spirit in that moment say, stay close. Yep. Yep. And what I loved about it was in the midst of my imperfect performance, his response wasn't, yeah, you're right, you're blowing it. <laughs> but his response was, just stay close. Amen. I thank God that we have a Savior in heaven who understands who feels what we feel Amen. and who has compassion on the things that we go through in life. Yes. Yep. 
I thank God because in Stay Close, what I realize is that all my ability in life to do anything that God calls me to do, all my ability comes from proximity to Jesus. Amen. That the closer I am to Jesus, the more able I am. That the closer I am to Jesus, the more able I am. And you fill in the blank to do anything. The closer I am to Jesus, the more able I am. So I love, man, God is so good. And I love stay close. And the passage of scripture that I was studying in was in the book of John. And Jesus was facing the most terrible scene in human history. The son of God was about to be crucified at the hands of man. He'd been telling his disciples, but he was at the point where his time had come. And everything he was facing was weighing heavily on his mind. And namely, people's reaction to him and their fate. Because Jesus had come to save all of them, but few were responding in a genuine way. He was even facing the collapse of his inner circle. They also were falling away. Judas was in the very process of betraying him. Peter, the leader of his disciples, was soon to deny Jesus publicly three times. And the rest of his disciples were going to flee and desert him. There was a lesson that his disciples desperately needed to learn. And it was the same lesson that Jesus spoke to me in that moment when he said, stay close. It was one of Jesus' relationships to his people. If you'll stand with me, we'll read this passage of scripture from John 15, verses 4 and 5. And it says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can be seated. And the part that hit me the hardest, and not the hardest in a bad way, but the, the part that resonated with me, because Jesus said, stay close. He said, this is why. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And I found it very interesting as I was reading previ- above John 15, um, just reading through the chapter of John, just for context and to see what is Jesus doing here. He, there's... Pr- there's several passages prior to that where Jesus is 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 submitting to that same order of obedience when he told us that apart from him we can do nothing he says of himself in John 5 19 Jesus gave them this answer very truly I tell you the son can do nothing by himself he can only do what he sees his father doing and and uh and the fifth chapter, the 30th verse, he says, by myself, I can do nothing. And then in 12, 49 through 50, he says, for I did not speak on my own, but the father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know this command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the father has told me to say, to say. And what, what I, what I got out of that was even when Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. There wasn't this, this um, position of arrogance or this, or this position of like ruly and lording over you and you better listen to me because he submitted in the same obedience to his father and he understood that apart from his father, he could do nothing. And say, so I, I just hear him saying, I humbly submit to you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So stay close. And so as I spent some time, these were just the, these were four points that he spoke to me personally. And I hope that they can encourage somebody in terms of reasons why we stay close. But the four, uh, four reasons to stay close. And the first one is to connect. That 
we have to understand that we are all made for relationship. Even science acknowledges that we're made for connection and relationship. A psychologist uh, named Matthew Lieberman wrote a book called Social, and this is a quote from his book. We may not like the fact that we are wired such that our well-being depends on connections with others, but the facts are the facts. And then if you know anything about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there's this hierarchy of, um, of needs that need to be established before you can achieve what he calls self-efficacy, before you can just become your full self. Um, but even in the middle of those, in the middle of that pyramid is love and belonging. So even the world of science will recognize our need for connection. In Genesis 1, 27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And as soon as Jesus, as soon as God created man, the first thing he started doing was connecting with him. He started relating to him. He started talking to him. It was the very first thing he did. This, I made this for you. I want you to live here and I want you to enjoy it. I want you to dwell in my presence and everything that I made here, I give to you. The very first thing he did was start connecting to us. In Jeremiah 32, 38 through 39, it says, they will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me and that all, and that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. In Revelation 3 and 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. See, from the very beginning, God wanted relationship with us. In Genesis, he wanted a relationship. In the middle of the Bible, in Jeremiah, he wanted a relationship. And at the very end in the book of Revelation, he still wants relationship with us. In the book of John, he says to remain in him. And it was such an important principle to Jesus that the word showed up 11 times in just six verses. Remain. Stay in me. Stay close. It was so important that he said the principle 11 times in six verses. Tony Evans asked the question in his book, The Power of Knowing God, how bad do you want it? I ask you, how bad do you want it? Because from the verses that we just read, to see that Jesus is looking for relationship from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end, he wants it bad. To know that he talks about remaining in him and he in you 11 times in six verses, remain in me, remain, and I will remain in you if you remain in me. He wants it bad. The question is, how bad do you want it? And as I grow and as I go through these seasons of life, um, my heart's cry is that I want it more and I want it more and I want it more, but I'm working on this process, this transition, and, and, the, and, and the Holy Spirit and God is working in me to move from this position of Lord, I need you because we do. We absolutely need God. But to move from this constant position of, Lord, I need you to, Lord, I want you. Lord, I don't just need you because everything's not going my way right now. But God, life seems to be pretty good. But I want you. Lord, I want you. Scripture says that blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. Delights, not suffers through the law of the Lord. Not struggles through the law of the Lord. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. Lord, I want you. The second point is to copy. We're supposed to copy the character of Jesus. We have to stay close if we're going to be able to copy the character of Jesus. 
John 15, 5, 7, 8 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This word showing and the phrase showing yourselves to be is defined in the Greek lexicon as to possess certain characteristics with the implication of their having been acquired. So Jesus is saying, showing yourselves to be my disciples, showing that you have acquired my characteristics, that you've copied me, that you've stayed close enough to know who I am and you've copied my characteristics. Second Peter 1, 5 through 8 says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and perseverance godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are these things? They're the characteristics. They're the personality traits of who Jesus is. And he said in verse seven, uh, excuse me, in verse eight, to this, and this is to my father's glory, that you bear much fruit. This is the fruit. Some of the fruit that we're supposed to bear is the personality traits of Jesus. As I walk through daily life, am I exhibiting these traits? Do I look like Jesus? Am I a copy of Jesus? If I'm not staying close, I can't copy Jesus. When you spend time, extensive time with someone, oftentimes you start to talk like that person. You start to think like that person. Some people would even say like (laughs) with their pet owners, like you kind of, you and your pet kind of look alike. (laughs) But the more time you spend with someone, the more you start to behave like that person. We would say, rub shoulders with that person or that they've rubbed off on you. I think about um, at home, we're a big sports house and my wife and I enjoy watching football games um, mostly, a lot of sports, but mostly football. And now Chance is starting to get some interest in it. He started to play some sports. It's starting to kind of tickle that competitive drive in him. And um, you know, he's, he's been watching more football games with us and he sees me and his mom in the middle of games and a ref makes a bad call. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're like, come on, ref. Like, what are you looking at? That's ridiculous. That, that, was, the last play. <laughs> <laughs> that was a couple, yeah, a couple of times. <laughs> and so it's funny because he sees us respond that way into the game. And the funny part is he doesn't really like understand the rules of the game at all. He understands points and he can tell which team has the most points. He understands who has possession of the ball because the person in that color jersey is holding it. But that's about it. That's about the total of what he understands in terms of the rules of football. But it's funny because, you know, he doesn't understand down and distance. He doesn't understand what a first down is and how you get a first down and that when you score the touchdown, you only get six points. You have to kick the field goal next to get seven points. So they scored a touchdown. Why do they only have six points, Dad? That's not fair. <laughs> what? So the down distance is like fourth and 10 and they're going for it, right? And they throw the ball. Just because he didn't catch the ball, the other team gets it. That's not fair. And it's funny because we're like, like, chill, man, you just don't get it yet. But what's happened is he sat with us. He sat next to us. He's watched us and we've rubbed off on him. He doesn't even know what he's complaining about at this point in time. But what he does know is that my mom and my dad do it. So I should do it. But staying close to Jesus requires time and repeated exposures. Chance didn't pick that up after one football game or after two or three or four even. He sat by us for several football games and picked that up. We didn't complain about one call. (laughs) We've complained about several calls. But staying close to Jesus, it requires time. Are you willing to give of your time? It requires repeated exposures. You can't just go once and expect to be filled. Amen. Amen. Psalm 17 and 15 
It says, I shall be satisfied when I awaken in your likeness. The third point is to conquer. See, the devil wants you apart from God. The third point is to conquer. And you need to grasp on that point because the devil wants you apart from God. Genesis 3, 1 and 2. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? See, as soon as God created man, as soon as God started relating to man, then the devil stepped in because he wanted to separate him. And you can look all through scripture and you can look all through your life. There's this pattern. As soon as God, then the devil. As soon as God created Adam and Eve, then the devil. As soon as the spirit of God descended on Jesus in his baptism, then the devil. As soon as you decide I'm going to follow Jesus, then the devil. As soon as God reveals purpose in your life, then the devil. As soon as God, then the devil. And I think one of the things is we've got to quit giving so much credit to the devil. Because as soon as he shows up in our life, the first thing we think of is the devil. What the devil's messing with me. The devil's, got to, the devil's trying to bring me down. The devil messed that up. The devil, the devil, the, no. As soon as God... Then the devil, Pastor Dan said last week, if you want to be aware of the presence of God, you got to talk about him. Right. We've got to notice yeah. and celebrate what God is doing in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. because then we'll stop giving the credit to the devil. We'll actually be able to attack, like CJ would say, be on the offensive and attack. Yeah. No, I saw this. God showed me this yesterday, devil. This isn't your doing. You're just mad because, because God's moving in my life. The, the devil doesn't want you close to God because he knows if you get close to God, if God starts to rub off on you, you will start walking in the authority that God has given you. The devil wants you apart from God. Jesus told the disciples in Luke, I've, in the book of Luke, that I've given you all authority over the power of the enemy. The enemy does not want you to get close to God because if you're close to God, you know the promises of God. And the promise of God is that you have all authority over the power of the enemy. And the devil doesn't want you to know what authority you have. Stay close. Stay close. The, the passage talks about being a branch in the vine, and Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. And as I was studying it, I found out that a vine can develop what's called a sucker shoot. And there's some images coming up. A sucker is a little shoot on the, on the, the vine that grows up and it doesn't have any purpose of producing fruit. But what it does is it takes the nourishment away from the branches that are going to produce fruit, and it stops those branches from producing fruit to their full potential. And they're called sucker shoots. And see, they're down at the bottom, at the very bottom of that uh, graphic. The sucker's down there at the bottom. And another thing I noticed, and I'm not 100% sure how it works, but I just thought it was interesting because it talks about us as Gentiles being grafted in. On a vine, there's a graft line. But suckers are only, they only shoot below the graft line. Suckers aren't grafted in to the branch. They're not a part of the vine. But what they do is they take away from the nourishment that the, the branch is supposed to receive. And they don't produce anything. Suckers come to take from you what belongs to you. Suckers limit what you need for fruit to bear. In your life. The question is, what suckers do you have in your life? And we're not talking about the suckers that Pastor Phil hands out. Those are good suckers. Those, <laughs> those are dum-dums. They're the good ones. But the question is, what suckers do you have in your life? People, relationships, television, hobbies. What's sucking the nutrients out of you that you need to produce fruit. And the hard part is, in and of themselves, these things aren't bad. They're not always bad. But anything that's robbing you 
of what you need to develop spiritual intimacy with Jesus, it's a sucker. You have to create boundaries in your life in order to allow yourself opportunities to stay close. You have to create boundaries in your life in order to allow yourself opportunities to stay close. The last one is to complete, to complete your joy. John 15 and 11 says this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Mm. The word joy in the Greek means cheerfulness. And I love this one, calm delight. It's a state of joy and gladness. It's different from happiness because happiness is a fleeting feeling. One moment I'm happy, the next I'm mad. One moment I'm happy, the next I'm sad. But joy is a state. It's calm delight. And the word complete here says to make replete. Replete means to be filled or well supplied with something. Jesus is telling his disciples, I've told you this so that my joy may make, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete, that you would be filled with my calm delight. And when I read that, I was thinking about, you know, the time that I went back to Jesus in prayer and, and shifting from Lord, I need you to Lord, I want you. Lord, I need you to Lord, I want you. And here's, I don't want to just go to Jesus when life is hard. Our family's gone through a hard season in life. And, and, and to be honest with you, sometimes those are good because they bring us closer. It's brought our family closer, but individually in our family, between me and my wife, it brought both of us closer to Jesus. But I don't want to just cry out to Jesus when I need him. And what I'm learning in this season right now, while things are pretty good, that I want to stay in a position, a heart posture of, Lord, I want you. God, everything's going good. Let's enjoy this moment together. Jesus, I want to enjoy the good parts of life with you. Lord, I want you. And part of the reason is that so my joy will be complete when the next hard season comes. Because I know a hard season is coming. (laughs) I've just lived enough life. I've got some gray hairs up here. I can say that now. (laughs) But I know another hard season is coming. And when it comes, I want the calm delight of Jesus to be my, to be my source. Pastor Dan said it like this. You need to be where you're supposed to be before you need to be there. I want my joy to be complete in Jesus before I'm in a position where I need my joy to be complete in Jesus. In closing, you can ask the question, how do we stay close? I gave you some four reasons why we should stay close, but how do we stay close? In John 15, 10, he said, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. You want to say it's that simple. But Jesus said, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. There's that humility in Jesus again that's saying it's okay. Like he's a good example to copy. Like if someone had the position, the, the, all the title, the rights to be arrogant in what they've done, it'd be him but he continually shows himself as humble. I only did what I saw my father doing. And his command was this, love each other as I have loved you. But if you're going to love the way that Jesus loves you, you have to stay close. Because apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. So stay close. Connect so much with Jesus that he rubs off on you. 
Be a copycat. See what Jesus is doing and do that. Be more than a conqueror, knowing that nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Be more than a conqueror and take joy knowing that you are complete in Jesus. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for being my calm delight. God, I thank you that no matter what comes my way, no matter what life throws at me, that I'm complete in you, Jesus. That your joy will be my strength. God, I thank you that it's not, it it doesn't matter how I perform. In all my imperfection, in my weakness, you are strong. As long as I stay close. Lord, help me to stay close. Staying close might look different for everyone in here. What it means to stay close in your own life, what it looks like to stay close in your own life in your own time of season. But I encourage you to stay close because apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. Thank you.